Carol told me how to make that uh, potato and uh, ham and cheese dish. You take a layer of potatoes and a layer of ham and a layer of cheese and you keep building it up until you use up all your potato. Then you take two cans of cream of mushroom soup and you thin it down with milk just enough where it'll pour. And then you bake it in the oven at 350 degrees and I believe it was 45 minutes. I'm not too sure on the time. But I tried it the other day without that. I tried it with asparagus and used it the same way. And it came out unbelievable. I had it for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, it sounds great. For two Papa. days. <laughs> I miss Carol's cooking. Yeah. We used to have a lot of fun, huh? Yeah. yeah I had a real good time with that. <laughs> Tell me about that uh, that car you were talking about earlier. All right. Truck. Yeah, they put uh, one of those e-motors in there. Uh, one of the new Chevrolet racing motors, they call it an e-motor. It's a crate motor. And when they put it in, the guy took an MDS uh, system to power it with only four wires. One for the ignition, one for ground, one for the uh, fuel system. I forgot what the other is now. But I, I told Katie Susie a while ago. The coil, but, huh? Yeah. But then he jumped in, just turned the key, and that thing started right up. And he was putting out 750 horsepower to rear wheels. And it was cooking, huh? Yeah. And Daddy wants to take his car motor and put it in his truck and do the same. He used to build cars since how old? You were eight? Well, Tell me about I your had. first car. I had my first car when I was uh, seven or eight years old, yeah. And what kind was it, Pop? 1934 Chevrolet with the knee action front end. The shock <laughs> absorber was the front end. And it bent in and out, up and down. And they called it knee action. They were the worst things that was ever made. <laughs> you bought it for a dollar, didn't you? Yeah. And it was taken all apart? Yeah, the motor was in the trunk, and I picked up a Chevrolet manual and a gasket set. The gasket set cost me six or eight bucks. And I put it all back together and got it running. And Mr. Ward down the street bought it from me for 12. <laughs> nice. Tell me about some of the stuff you went through with your cars and Grandpa, stuff like that. Well, Grandpa made me get rid of a lot of them. Yeah, but what about the lawman? <laughs> you told some good stories back then about lawmen. <laughs> yeah. My 39 Ford, I had an old 88 in that thing. It could start off in high gear. Third gear is only a three gear, gear transmission. <laughs> the back wheels would be smoking. And they, in 1955, 56, 57, the policeman drove those Chevrolet six cylinders and he had to stop you. You had a sign for your ticket, and then he gave you the ticket. I wouldn't stop for them. <laughs> they were too slow. I'd be home in bed for almost an hour before they got up to Mom's house. <laughs> Put the hose up the tailpipes. Went and go to bed. And they come up, and Dad say, "Oh, he's up in bed. He's he's been sleeping for about an hour." Yeah, but he's been out on the streets, and we couldn't catch him. Uh, Nothing Dad can do about it. <laughs> so, about three months later, they come up with a court order and made me dismantle it. Oh, man. What do you mind, John Warman bought all the parts as I took it apart. And that was his demise, him and his dad. Mm -hmm. In a tree in Green Hill Park. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a lot of good cars. Yeah. Mr. Foote gave me an 1891 uh, international buckboard. My dad says, you get that goddamn thing out of here before I light a match to it because it was all wood. And it didn't have a steering, it had a tiller in the front. And when you go up uh, uh, the hill there, 
You had to get out of sight of it and run with it to help it get up the hill before it conked out. <laughs> and when you went down the hill, you had to be real careful because the brakes would be smoking before you got to the bottom. <laughs> Yeah, it was quite a car, but Dad wouldn't let me keep it. Bring it back to Mr. Fort. Now it's up in the Princeton Auto Museum, and it's valued over $100,000. Dad wouldn't let me have it. And I bought Dad's 55 Ford. Put a whole new nose section on that when he smashed the front end off of it. Going down to register it, I come back home and it ain't there no more. They scrapped it on me. Dad was fussy about having cars in his yard. If they weren't running, they're gone. <laughs> that was your life, though. Oh, yeah, I've always had cars taken apart. Mm -hmm. Down Barbie Lane, I don't know how many cars I picked apart and put. Other ones together with the parts I took out of them. Remember the one that all us kids pulled the paint off your head? Yeah. <laughs> that was a what, a Ford Galaxy? Yeah, that was a 55 Galaxy two door hardtop. That had a 360 engine in it. That was just a little bitty thing. <laughs> because they had a 390 out at that time, and they had a 407 out, and a 390, and a 427. So that was considered a small motor. <laughs> I remember your Lincoln. Yeah. How many cars did you roll on the B-Line? On the B-Line, only one. Uh, the Lincoln... I went down through the woods at Boggy Creek where the road turns. I didn't make the turn. I went flying down through the woods. <laughs> Ended up giving that thing a meathead and they put it on the track <laughs> in the demolition derby. Which one did you roll on the B-Line? The, the B-Line, that was the uh, 68 Dodge. Mexican John was with me. <laughs> Flipped that thing over and was sliding on a on the roof going through the grass and hit something in the grass and it flipped it back on its four wheels and threw it up in second and give it the gas and get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> How about some stories with Uncle Sonny and you? Uh, well, Uncle Sonny, I don't think I'd appreciate me telling <laughs> anybody about the colored girls. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, we won't talk about all that. No. Yeah. <laughs> I was talking about cars. <laughs> well, the one he had those colored girls in was that 55 Chevrolet sedan delivery uh, truck. Was that the Peacock one? Yeah, the guys at uh, Webster Square just put a brand new engine in it and they couldn't get it going. And he was in there to get some parts for Uncle Sonny. He was parked out front. Those guys were working out back. And they never come back in the store, so I went out back to see what they were doing. And they were working on that, and I told them I had to have pass for Sonny, and the guy says, I'm going to junk this goddamn thing. I'm sick of it. I said, well, junkyard price is 25 bucks. I'll give you 25 bucks for it. He just sold. Nice. He handed me the title. And while he was in getting Sonny's parts put together, I went over there and put the distributor back <laughs> 360 degrees off. Fired right up. Nice. Oh, those guys were pissed. And Uncle Sonny said, I have to have that. It's, the truck was only three years old at the time. Oh, man, I was five years old. I loved that truck. It was really dark green with a beautiful peacock on the sides. Yeah. That's why Sonny had to have it. It's showing TVs. <laughs> yeah, man. He was in the antenna business. Yeah, my daddy's a TV radio man. Mechanic, electronic tech. Definitely. Definitely blessed, huh, Pop? Yeah. Well, the Sonny and I used to have a lot of fun. I miss him. Yeah. He had his uh, foot cut, and uh, now he can walk without his shoes irritating his feet. He had to have the top of his big toe cut. 
Yeah, Laurie said that to me. She goes, you got toes like Uncle Sonny. You know he had to have them. I says, yeah, they're huge, ain't they? The big yeah. toes. Oh, no, I put that in there. Yeah. But, you know, he had a hole in his hat. Never yeah. knew that. Yeah, he had to go to the hospital. He wouldn't tell me what was wrong. He says, well, I just have to go to the hospital and have something taken care of. Wow. He had a hole in his hat. I never knew. Yeah. Oh, and I talked to him the next time. He says, I got a patch on my hat. I said, you got what? He says, yeah. He says, I had just an itty bitty hole. He says, they grabbed the skin over it. He says, it's a patch. <laughs> but it works. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Yeah, but we used to bet. I used to tell him his alcohol would get him before my cigarettes get me. <laughs> I guess right now we're tied. He had to have his stomach removed from the drinking. He has a colostomy bag, whatever the heck they call it. And mm -hmm. My lungs are gone. <laughs> well, I guess we're tied. I can't smoke no more. And he still has a glass of wine every night. He says the doctor approves of it. And he says, Laurie, when she comes by, sits down and has a glass of wine with me. Cool. Yeah. You guys have had a good life. Yeah, he's lasted real long. Mm. <laughs> yeah. He's done real good. He's what, 87 now? Mm -hmm. How old are you, Papa? I'll be 82 in April. I was saying 83. Yeah. Daddy's birthday is the 6th. Oh, that's Mark. You're 13th, huh? Huh? Are you the 13th or the 6th? 13th, Mark yeah. is, your brother Mark is at 6. Amen. I'm getting another brother, Mark. Yeah. They're both the 6. They're both the 6? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. And Debbie's Mark has always been so good to me when I go up there. He's got all the cars, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. Every time I went up there, if it was warm weather and the track was open, we'd go. <laughs> yeah, take his car and show me how fast it could go. You know what I love about Mark? He goes, are you scared? <laughs> yeah. He used to ask me that all the time. I'm not scared. <laughs> I said, Mark, if you knew me when I was young, I would have scared you. <laughs> Amen. Billy, when we were little, we'd be going up uh, to Bithlow and... He's like, why are we going fast, Uncle Mark? He goes, the police are coming. He goes, go faster, Uncle Mark, go faster. <laughs> yeah, last time I went up there, I didn't ride in this newer one there that he just built. What's it got? Chevette. Tell me about it. Not Corvette, Chevette. Yeah. Uh, I think it's 1980. Nice. And uh, it'll whoop all the cars he's had, and he's had some real fast cars. Where does he go? Tuscawilla? Uh, he goes to uh, Lasseter Mountain. And Seal is the one that has big money. Nice. If you're racing on the days that they're racing for money. Does he do the nitro? Oh, yeah, he has nitro and everything. Plus, he's got roller rockers and everything. Board and stroke. He knows enough to re rework the heads, open the ports on the head so that the engine breathes better. He knows all the old secrets that I used to know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, we used to swap toilet paper at Christmas. We'd give <laughs> them the Chevy and they'd give us the Ford because my daddy was a Ford mechanic. Yeah. We At the time, I'm yeah. a Falcon kind of girl. I know where there's a truck and I can pick up real reasonable too. Don't tell Con me. Convertible. Oh no. With a 428 fuel injected <laughs> engine in it. Uh, the I'm guy's saying. up where Mama used to be. Yeah. His name is Paul. He said, I wouldn't sell it to anybody but a, somebody that would appreciate it. He said, so no, I think he'd fit that category. I would love a Falcon he said, but again. I don't think you could afford a car. He said, I want 20 for that. Mm hmm. Well, cars ain't cheap anymore. He says, that is a special made car. You don't have the sh uh, talk sh shock towers and springs hooked together. It's got what they have under the 68 Mark 1s. Mm -hmm. He says, and it's from the factory that way. Oh. And he says, 
Ford's big engine back then was a 289. Mm -hmm. This is uh, 428 that was in it was put in at the factory because they had to sell so many of that engine to keep it in competition with NASCAR. You should tell NASCAR don't even have that rule. But you have to have so many engines in production. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, NASCAR had that ruling that it had to be an engine that was run on the streets as well before they modified it. So, since Toyota got with them, uh, they had to take them remove all that stuff because Toyota wasn't going to build cars for the road. <laughs> oh man, I'm telling you, I got a little Batmobile. I would love to have a 429 in <laughs> or something. Well, uh, Toyota kidding. makes a big V8 for racing now. Yeah, yeah. And the guys that are running Toyotas are all doing very good. Mm. That's all I seen was your Toyotas when I came yeah. down here today. Uh, Matt Kenson, that used to be Mama's favorite driver. I got her watching TV when I bought this house, <laughs> watching the races. Uh -huh. And Matt Kenson was her favorite. And now he's driving a Toyota. <laughs> and Mark Martin, before, uh, before he retired, he went to Toyota. And uh, I think of that other fellow there. Uh, Tony Curtis drove... Uh, Toyota for a couple of years, but then when he found out uh, General Motors wasn't going to sponsor his track anymore, he went back to racing General Motors, Chevrolet's. Oh, Carl Edwards is the other one from uh, Ford that went over to uh, NASCAR and Toyotas, which I didn't think was right. Mr. Roush gave him the opportunity to get in a race, and he could at least uh, spend a little more time with Mr. Roush. Yeah, no doubt. Can't say nothing bad about Matt Kenson because he started with Roush, and he was with him for over 10 years before he swapped. And the same with Mark Martin. Mark Martin was with him 15 years, I guess, before he swapped over. But Mark yeah. made all his records with a Ford. Tony Stewart retired this year. Yeah. Yeah. Mark's brother is going to be disappointed on that, Red. <laughs> Hi, Red. Yeah. Hi, Mark, Debbie. <laughs> yeah, my papa, he can definitely drive. I've definitely had fun. Sitting in a car with him. We had a lot of fun driving. Especially in the 80s. <laughs> I was in my 20s then. And yeah, I drove stock car at Westboro, Peabody, and Drake. Until mm -hmm. I found out I was underage and they told me I'd never drive on the track again. <laughs> you didn't need it though, you had the street. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun while I did drive, though. Amen. Took me a year and a half to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of fun during the time I was having fun, though. Mm -hmm. I love you, Papa. I drove the double zero for a buddy of mine, <laughs> and the two zeros were boobs. <laughs> what kind of car was this? That was a 35 Ford. <laughs> what color? Uh, Multicolor, mostly red, blue, green, and peach. White. <laughs> the double zeros. Yeah, he had a girl's boobs painted on the car and <laughs> two cutouts, not the two zeros. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you then? Uh, 17. <laughs> Did you ever spin out in the snow? Oh yeah. Yeah. Come down Huntington Ave. That comes off of East 
I mean, off of uh, Indian Lake on the backside, mm -hmm. on the West Boylston Street, and it comes straight down. <laughs> I was going to say West Boylston. Yeah. I put my brakes on, but the car didn't stop. But thank God I didn't hit nothing. And the plow had just gone by and left a big pile of snow that I ended up in. <laughs> we managed to get out and get home. Had to do a little digging. That was my 50 Dodge convertible. Never put a scratch on that car. Not even then, huh? No. Nope. Just cushioned it in the snow pile. Yep. Thank you, Lord. But those were tough cars back then, too. Mm-hmm. It's real heavy metal, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I took my car to the parking lot at the store down on uh, North Bush to add there. I forgot the name of it. But I put it in the parking lot to go in the store, and when I come out, it was a brand new Mercury, a 1948 Mercury, totally. He drove right into my Model A. Didn't put a scratch on the Model A. <laughs> Total hit brand new car out. Nice. He says, thank God you weren't in your car. I says, I could have been in my car. You didn't do nothing to it. You didn't even wrinkle it. <laughs> you didn't even scratch the paint. He said, I know. He says, if I a brand new car and it ain't worth the shit. I says, man, I swapped you right now, even with your car wrecked. <laughs> a little four-banger. <laughs> nice. <laughs> the fastest that poor little thing would go is 62 miles an hour. Yeah. <laughs> I love the Lord. He... I should have been gone when I was five years old. How come? I don't believe it's well. I picked up the cover, didn't even know it was a well. I picked up the cover, it rain, I'm holding it over my Man. head and start walking. Boom, down the well I went. How'd he get you out? I believe I had to climb down. It was a good thing Bill was with me. They come out and says, Where's Sonny? Oh, he put the cover over his head and sat walking and fell on the ground. Oh, no. <laughs> so. How old were you? Five? That's five. Bill was about three, four. Mm. So he didn't know the difference. Yeah. <laughs> Just I went down the hole on the ground. <laughs> and then when I was seven, I almost drowned at Bell Pond. They had that fence that goes around to keep the young kids in. Mm -hmm. I dove under it and got sucked by the ankle. And the lifeguard saved me that time. Mm -hmm. The good Lord's been with me because several times I was going to drown. And now I drown in my own lungs. <laughs> How long has it been since you had a cigarette, Pop? Uh, was it two months? Wow. I'm glad. Yeah. Well, I gave him up for a whole year while Carol was up there. And when she sat going bad again, I... I figured, well, I'll just get a cigarette. I went over and I said, well, you can't buy a cigarette. You have to get the pack. Yeah. So stupid me, I bought a pack of cigarettes and I figured, well, I'll just smoke this pack and I won't get no more. You smoked the pack and you hung on them again. Yeah, well, I quit for four years one time. Yeah. And all it took was one, one, just one little drag and I was hooked again. Yeah. But I haven't smoked since 2008. And it's yeah. 2017 almost, so thank you, Lord. Yeah. Tell me about Uncle Billy and you, Daddy. Oh, Bill and I were very, very close until they got married. Yeah. They got married very young, too. I guess he was around 17, 18. No, he's younger than that. Wow. Dad and Mom had a sign for him to get married. Wow. Well, we did have our fun. Mm -hmm. We used to go up to Amherst College, the girls' college. <laughs> with these nice, fancy, rich girls. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> That's why I can't see him marrying the way he did. But that was his life. He's got good kids, though. 
Oh, he's got wonderful kids. Drew's just like one of my own. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I miss Uncle Bill, too. I didn't know him too oh, well, but I always, when I, I was little, I loved him so much. Yeah, I, I miss the heck out of him, too. He used to double date. <laughs> because I had a car, and Bill didn't. And uh, my dad says, well, you got to be fair. He says, uh, you got to take your brother with you. And Bill, as soon as we got out of the dad's sight, let me drive it. <laughs> <laughs> His name was Laura Sigrid Sophia Baxter. Wow. <laughs> and you ought to see her birth certificate in there and her uh, paper from the church when she got confirmed. They put artwork into them back in them days. Man, I they were beautiful. It. I'll have to. They're in there I'll somewhere. Have to see them. Yeah. <laughs> and I got Dad's uh, papers for uh, stating that he was born in Westminster, Sweden. Mm, I was gonna say I heard that they both were from Sweden, right? Direct? No, no. no? Uh, Mama was born in the United States, but both of her parents were from Sweden. From Sweden. Yes. And Grandpa, I believe, was Swede Pin. He was Swedish. His parents were Swedish, but they had gone to Finland, and she had Grandpa Gus in Finland and went back. Yeah, I was just going to say, it has to be Grandpa Gus. I yeah. remember him. Yeah, so um, he used to say, I'm a Swede Pin. Swede Pin? Yeah. School. <laughs> so Farmore came over on the boat, right? Yeah, and so did my dad. Yeah. My dad was six years old. Wow. But his dad had come long before them to get everything established where they'd have a place to come and awesome. everything. And they ended up in Worcester, Mass? Yeah. And that's where he met Grandma, huh? Yeah. What did he do for a living, Pop? Grandpa? Grandpa, he worked for uh, Morgan Construction Company, Morgan Mills. They built mills for other countries. And then he was a... Steel working. Cool. He was a musician, too. A teacher? Uh, well, he could play any wind instrument you brought in. And uh, he loved playing organ. And he was a member of the Salvation Army band, even though he wasn't a Salvationist. Yeah. He just loved music. And a bunch of his friends that were in the band there, so he... Joined up with them. Mm -hmm. He was appealing on anybody that didn't show up. He could play all the wind instruments, so it didn't matter. So every time you see a picture of him, he's playing something different. Because nice. he was appealing for whoever didn't show up. <laughs> yeah, my daddy, he wore top hat and tail coats. Yeah. He could play a mean guitar, too. And sing, he could yodel, he could do anything. Yeah, yeah. Those days are gone forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you still be singing, Pop. Uncle Sonny still tries to play his dulcimer once in a while. Yeah, he builds them too, yeah. huh? Yeah. Man. He gave you his mandolin, didn't he? He gave me a banjo. A banjo. And yeah. I went to Alabama with it, and somebody stole it. With a couple of the guitars. Yeah, he had a banjo, he had a mandolin, and then he's had a couple different dulcimers. Yeah, you guys used to party on the uh, houseboat. On the houseboat, Indian Lake. Oh, yeah, those were good, good days. Tell me about them. Like Friday and Saturday night, we'd buy a keg of beer and put it on the middle of the boat, and we'd all set sail. <laughs> <laughs> Play. Music and just every time somebody got drunk, you threw them in and threw them a lifesaver, you know, tube to put around them and push them back in on the, on the way back. For the next trip around the lake, we make five or six runs around the lake at night, singing and playing, raising heck and drinking. Good old days. Was Mott, Mott's daddy, Andy and Jimmy Mott's father, was he one of you guys' musicians? 
That's where the soul of son was, his houseboat. That's what I was wondering because I ended up with the children, and we all had our own bands, and they yeah. were really good players, man, let me tell yeah. you. Well, Andy used to always watch us when we were playing guitars, see what we put in our fingers. <laughs> yeah, he started as a drummer, and his brother, uh, yeah. no, Jimmy started as a, a drummer, and Andy started as a guitarist, and then they switched, yeah. from what I heard. But man, they players. could play. They yeah. could play. Oh, and they loved music when they were little, little. Man, yeah. they loved music. We'd go out on the houseboat, Jimmy would say, no, you can't come, you know, you could fall over. And all of us drunks would be too drunk to know that you fell over. <laughs> and they'd cry, we want to come listen to the music, Daddy. Mm -hmm. Well, if you shut up, you can sit on the dock and you can hear us all over the lake. Mm -hmm. We're a bunch of loudmouths. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that because we would sit on the shoreline while you guys were out. Yeah, and uh, <coughs> there was a couple down the end of the lake down toward uh, uh, the Norton Company. Yeah. Down by Norton Beach. They had a glass A-frame house. Wow. You could look right through the house like it wasn't even there. And they'd be out on the front porch yelling, come on, sing some more, we want to hear you. <laughs> nice. That's the best part. We uh, played on the St. John's one time, and they were getting off the river, off their boats, and coming over and listening. So mm -hmm. I, I love music, too. Oh, I <laughs> Uncle Bill played an accordion. You ever hear that song, Towards Midnight on the Ocean? Not mm -hmm. a streetcar was in sight. Uh -uh. The sun was shining brightly in the middle of the night. A barefoot boy with shoes on stood there sitting in a tree. And when I put my glasses on, he looked right down on me. Be kind to your wet footed friends, or a duck may be somebody's mother. <laughs> I forgot now. That's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the sun was shining brightly in the middle of the night, a barefoot boy with shoes on <laughs> stood there <laughs> sitting in a tree. In other words, everything's opposite of what. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't see streetcars in the ocean in the middle of the night. Mm -mm. And I used to love that little Nash Rambler song too, but I've forgotten that. It starts off where I'm riding in my Cadillac, much to my surprise. That little Nash Rambler kept following me. He's only third my size. Beep, 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 beep. His horn went beep, beep, beep. He must have wanted to pass me out the way he's shooting that horn. I'll teach him that a Cadillac is not a copy phone. Beep, 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 beep. His home went beep, beep, beep. But it goes all through that until at the end, the uh, little Nash Rambler passes him and says, how do you get this thing out of second gear? <laughs> nice. And they're doing over 120. <laughs> nice. Norm just texted before this video and said, tell Sonny I want a Cadillac for Christmas. So <laughs> here's your Cadillac, Mac. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's one car I never want. Yeah. The money They're pit. so expensive right now. They have money pits. Yeah. They keep breaking down. You're not dependable. All the time my mom had that car, it kept breaking down. when. She finally gave it to me to get it out of here. And I took it, made it up to Alabama, and it died again. I don't know how many starters we put in that thing, how many alternators we put in that thing. But it had an external oil pump. And when you changed oil, it wouldn't pick up the prime again. And you had to pack it with Vaseline, take the oil pump off, and pack it with Vaseline and stick it back on. A modern car, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's as old-fashioned as you can get. That, that was something you had to do back in the 20s. 
Yeah. Kind of like the only one that did that. <laughs> and the only one with an external oil pump. Well, which car was it when we went to the dealership? It was in the, you said, I wouldn't buy another one of these. It's lemon. At least I got the color right. It was lemon yellow. Yeah, I forgot. What, what <laughs> that was that. mom's car. Yeah. At least I got the color right. Lemon yeah. yellow. <laughs> yeah. God bless you, Papa. Yeah. Next time I come, I'll bring a guitar. I don't think I'd be able to do anything with it anymore. My fingers are so soft now. It's all right. Pick it up for a second anyway. <laughs> I seen a Martin uh, L12 the other day on uh, Antique Roadshow. Yeah. They have estimated it to be over ten thousand yeah. dollars magnificent shape the guy hadn't uh well his son had it he says it ain't been played since my dad died 50 years ago it was just like a brand new one and once in a while you see gibsons and fenders but you never see a gretch I'll have to take you to a music store if you let me, because I saw some Gretches today. Oh, man. They were a good guitar. Had the Bigsby on it, even. Yeah. I had to stop and get some strings. Uh, I forgot the name of the fellow that was a professional player that played a, a Gretch. Uh, wasn't Chet Atkins. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. He had a Gibson and a Gretch. He says, I would never part with either one of them. Mm -mm. I had a couple of good bit Gibsons. Man, I like My the My first Gibson mm -hmm. was a pork chop. Uh, uh, Les Ooh. Paul Jr. Wow. It's only about that long. <laughs> nice. Got that brand new for $178. What started you in guitars, Daddy? Uncle Hank. I, I wish I met. I wish I remembered him. Dad made us all take piano lessons, and Mrs. Hawkins said I took piano lessons from. She just told Dad, Bill's doing fine, Connie's doing fine, but Carl keeps looking out the window at the kids playing uh, baseballs and saying, I wish my dad would get me a guitar. Nice. <laughs> but he never would. He says, if you ain't going to learn piano, you ain't going to learn nothing. Because once you learn piano, you can play anything. Yeah. And he got paid because Uncle Henry bought me uh, one of those uh, Gene Autry plastic guitars <laughs> and taught me the chords on it. And he says, when you can play it, he says, I'll get you something better. <laughs> nice. Tell me about all that guitar stuff, Papa. Yeah. I like the history. Mm -hmm. He got me my first 22. Got me my first 16-gauge pump shotgun. Mm -hmm. And when I started hunting with him, he says, well, he says, we're going to upgrade you. He says, we can get you 12-gauge automatic. <laughs> Which he did. He was very, very good to me. Mm -hmm. But that's because he only had a girl. He didn't have no boys. Nobody to go fishing and hunting with him. Mm -hmm. What was his wife's name? Ethel. Ethel. Yeah. They kind of raised you, huh? Hmm? Did they kind of raise you? Uh, for a while, when I got in trouble, I took my Pontiac, well, Bill took my Pontiac and went down the back road and mm -hmm. didn't start. He thought he could make it start rolling down the hill and put it in gear and turn the key on. <gasps> and the cop down there confiscated Jimmy Reardon. And I got peeved and I went and got my crank. Bill didn't know that you could crank it, but the crank was under the porch. I went and got my crank and went down to the cop's house and put the chains on the back because he pushed it over the bank and where you can get no traction. I put the chains on it and I put the crank in the engine and pulled the throttle out in the car and choked and cranked it by hand and got it going. And then I did donuts all over his yard. I drove through his hedges. 
go right up against his front porch, put some scratch marks on the house, and took the car and put it back down in my dad's woods so that he wouldn't see it. And I knew he was looking for me, so I said, Uncle Hank, can I go up to Maine with you? Because he was living in Maine. I went up there for eight months. How old were you? About 16. <laughs> What part of Maine? Uh, Norway, Maine, and South Paris, Maine. Cool. And I had the time of my life with them going to all those minstrel shows. He used to play in all the minstrel shows. Awesome. Yeah. And they used to take a cork and burn it and blacken my face with it. And I sing those old docky songs with them. <laughs> nice. You remember any? Old Man River, that old man river, he must know something, but don't say nothing, he just keep rolling, he just keep rolling along. Tired and weary, yeah, I'm forgetting all that stuff. You still got it, Papa. I'm sick and tired of living in fear of dying. Those are all old Joel uh, Olson songs, the called man. Uh huh. Yeah. We'll have to find some of that for you so you can sing along with them and remember. They were minstrel shows, is what they call them. Okay, cool. We'll, we'll definitely get on that for you. Then you can relearn them. And I'll get you singing them again. I ain't going to be singing no more. My lungs are going on. You sure sound good, Daddy. But it makes me hurt like hell when oh, I sing. Okay. I'm just trying to remember how all the good times we had. Mm -hmm. Used to make dandelion wine. I moved over to Harry Gould's farm. Because Henry was working so much hours, and Henry thought, well, it'd be good for me to work. So I went over to the milk farm and had to milk all the cows in the morning. He had hundreds of them. We put machines on them and then hand stripped them after, you know, yeah. so you wouldn't burn the cow out. You shut the machine off and finish them by hand. But we used to pick the dandelions, make dandelion wine. And the elderberries and make elderberry wine and all kinds of fruit wines. And Harry's wife was an alcoholic, so we had to hide all of that up in the hayloft up in the barn under the hay. And we used to take bottles of different kinds with us when we went on a minstrel show for the weekend. <laughs> Ethel played the piano when we went. Henry played the accordion, and Harry Gould played the guitar and a banjo. It was uh, these two brothers, Keith and I forgot the other one's name. They played banjo and mandolin, and they were always dressed up as colored people too. And they could all sing too. Uncle Hank didn't do much for singing, but him and Ethel did the main music. And all the others filled in, and I was one of the singers with the black face. <laughs> nice. Was Uncle Hank grandma's or daddy's? That's my mama's brother. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. He had another brother, but we only seen him, I guess, once in my whole lifetime. What was his name? Uh, let's see, Uncle John, John Baxter. Nice. But she used to call him Volomar. Mm -hmm. That was his Scandinavian name. Yes. He come from the old country. Mm -hmm. But Henry was born in the United States. And my mom and her sisters were born here. But, uh, lost track of Uncle John. When he did come to Worcester, that, that's when I had my Dodge convertible. He was an alcoholic, if ever there was one. Where can you get some booze? That's the first thing he said to me. I said, well, I'm underage. He said, I'm sorry. 
That's but I still know where to get it. <laughs> yeah, he went down a, the little road that went in behind the silver dollar off of Union Street. Pulled down the alley and knocked on the door and says he'll buy a ten dollar. It was a Sunday morning, he ain't supposed to be in there himself. I said, uh, just need a pint to get my uncle to settle down. And he said, it's going to cost you two bucks, which is extremely high for back then. So I gave him two bucks and sent me out the bottle. Give it to Uncle John. Oh, I can't remember this place. As a matter of fact, I do when I was a little boy. I remember my father coming here. Grandpa Gus? Yeah, Grandpa Gus used to drink there and at the Hotel de Nord and at the Valhalla. Mm -hmm. I've heard of the Valhalla. You, you've mentioned that one. Oh, yeah. Jimmy Byers, he's a Greek fella. <coughs> he almost killed me. He bought it from a bunch of Swedes. That's why he kept the name Valhalla. But all the time I was going to boys' trade school, I'd go over there and have a liquid lunch. You know, my 21st birthday, I didn't know it. Everybody says, uh, come on down to Valhalla tonight. You're old enough to drink now. Okay. Get in there and they got me my drink. And then they come out with a birthday cake and 21 candles on it. And Jimmy Wise says, how old are you? And the guy says, he's 21. And he's been drinking in here five years. That son of a bitch could have had me locked up and closed my bar down. He <laughs> <laughs> was quick to be tied. How'd you meet Mama? How did I meet Mama? Yeah. You're awful sunny. I was doing a roofing job with him. And, uh, he says, well, let's go get some pork chops and stuff to eat. So we did. He says, well, we got to go back over to this guy's house so we can get paid after. And he spent all his money on getting that meal. And we went over to get his pay from the guy, and the guy wasn't home. And he says, well, let's go up to my sister's. I know where the guy hangs out. We'll catch up with him later. He says, let's go up to my sister's. And Sonny had already given my pay the day before. So your mama says, Sonny, can I borrow some money from you? Sonny says, I'm totally busted right now. He says, son of a bitch ain't give me my pay yet. I got to go pick it up. I said, but she can have my pay because I've already ate. He says, we can make it up later. So I gave her my pay and... She didn't even know who the hell I was, and I didn't know her. No. I gave her the pay he'd given me a day before. <laughs> How old were you guys? Huh? How old were you? I was probably 25, 26. <laughs> so mom already had kids already, huh? Hmm? Mom already had Sandy, Brian, and David? Yeah. Nice. And uh, Sonny and I... She, Left and he says, I know where the son of a bitch is. He says, he's down on Milbury Street in the back. He said, we're going to take a little ride down here. And he says, uh, I'm supposed to be paid at the end of the job. The guy says he'd have cash for me that he'd cash the check. So we went down here. So he just sat his ass right next to the guy. And the guy's talking to the guy on the other side. And so he just taps him on the shoulder. They get something. Oh, Sonny, I'm glad you're here. I don't have to go looking for you. It's here's your money. Nice. <laughs> so you and mom remained friends all after that, huh? You know, she just says uh, to Sonny, I didn't go back anymore, you know. She says to Sonny, you can tell your friend I went with him on a date. <laughs> she knew you were a musician, too, because she told me. She goes, I, I fell in love with that guy. <laughs> we went out a couple times, and... One time, Marvin and I went up to uh, Pleasant Street. So, by, I think the name of it was the Pleasant. And we went in there. We sat at the bar and we were having a drink. And your mom and Midge come in. And Marvin kicked me in the ankle. I turned around, what's your problem, Marvin? 
He says, uh, Major Cuse come in. He says, I don't want to talk to her. He says, this just gave me crap. <laughs> oh, no. I says, well, you go to the bathroom and go out the window, and I'll follow you in a couple minutes. The next time I seen your mom, she says, how come you ducked out on us? <laughs> I says, why well, haven't I... Didn't want to be around Mitch because he caught the crabs. <laughs> he says, yeah, I know two other guys that got them from it too. Oh, no. <laughs> says, but you know, you can uh, go out on a date with me anytime you want. All you have to do is let me know. Says, okay, but not tonight. I had a date with another girl named Barbara. <laughs> Matter of fact, I was engaged to Barbara. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, the things you don't know. <laughs> Mm. Her brother still calls me once once a year. I haven't heard of him in the last few years. Though. Barbara's brother? Yeah. Cool. He's lost one one of his brothers and one of his sisters. He said, but Barbara was still alive two years ago when he talked to me. Nice. I was five years older than her. Yeah. Laurie's auto insurance man was a good friend of mine, too. Lenny Cook. I went out with both of his sisters, too. <laughs> they were nice young girls. Yeah. I sure enjoy you telling me your stories, Daddy. It's just I've had a very, very good life. The good Lord's always been with me. Yes, sir. I know that one. He took care of us all our lives. He sure gave you a good imagination. My papa could always tell a good story. He'd put us to bed and he'd always tell us stories. I remember the one about the robot that went up underneath the lake and you and Uncle Bill were peddling it. <laughs> <laughs> and Louis the Lightning Bug. <laughs> yeah. Don't touch the electrical sockets, cause <laughs> no. oh man! I used to tell you a lot of stories about Louis the Ghost. <laughs> yeah, Louis the Ghost. That's the one. <laughs> I was always afraid of the storm, cause we moved here from Massachusetts down to Florida at Halloween time, and it was there were some drastic storms when. Yeah, well, I can remember the, uh, the Halloween first one. Oh, yeah. We weren't even moved in yet. Our furniture hadn't got here. I didn't know where the heck you kids went trick-or-treating. I didn't know the neighborhood. I got lost on Barbie Lane. <laughs> That's where we lived. I all over the place for you kids. Yeah. We had yes. everybody but Glenn at that time, I think, 67, huh? Uh, I don't remember. Maybe well, we did have Glenn. That picture you have on your phone? That's from the day that we moved down to Florida. Wow. That's Glenn that's in her arms. Yeah. We, we moved down in a station wagon, huh? Yeah, 63 Ford. <laughs> Six on the standard ship with overdrive. <laughs> and we bought the realty house in Belle Isle, huh? Yeah. Used to be their business office. Wow. And they added rooms to it. It used to be a one room shack when it was first built. <laughs> and they added rooms to it and they added the kitchen to it. And eventually they had a house. <laughs> yeah, it was a beautiful neighborhood. Yeah, had some real good neighbors. <laughs> 